Uh, hello everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Lena Palanyapan. Um, I wanted to uh, bring you a summary of um, the most pertinent points from the Kasturi Rangan report. This is the New Education Policy of India 2019 draft version that is published um, online by the Government of India. Um, I just want to highlight some of the issues I have with this policy um, and also uh, make some points on what you should do now before it becomes too late. This is one of the most important constitutional uh, proposals that has come out from the Government of India in recent times. Um, even though the policy is titled as an education policy, this is going to have an overreaching impact uh, on many things that we do in India. Um, the future of your, your children um, is at question, so please pay some attention to this um, presentation. So, what is what are my conflicts of interest? I am a Tamil speaker. Um, I can write Hindi, read Hindi, but I cannot speak that well. I'm a medical doctor, I'm a neuroscientist, and I'm also a psychiatrist. So, what is this policy? This policy is um, something that was released by the Ministry of Human Resource Development. Um, you can uh, read the uh, PDF document. It's a 484-page four, document, PDF file, um, called a draft policy revised version. And you can get this in this link, mhrd.gov.in. So um, the policy starts with a very enthusiastic endorsement from um, the uh, then Minister of uh, Human Resource Development, uh, Mr. Prakash Javadekar. Um, in his preface, in his message, uh, he is very enthusiastic about this and he says um, several stakeholders have been consulted in preparing this uh, draft and in-depth consultations have occurred. So uh, his preface seems to suggest that um, lots of work has uh, gone into preparing this um, draft which actually means that the government is more or less uh, pleased with itself for producing this draft and any public consultation is slightly to be uh, only a small proportion of um, uh, the actual uh, procedure, the processes that has been uh, already put in place for preparing this report. And there is an impressive list of people who are involved in, uh, uh, who have been involved in creating this report. That includes Dr. Kasturi Rangan, who is the former chairman of uh, ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization. Um, this is a man with uh, nearly 16 uh, doctorates, PhD, um, honorary doctorates conferred upon him. Um, he's a very learned man and you also have a, a team of other uh, learned uh, educationalists uh, from Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, um, UP, New Delhi, Karnataka. Uh, and there also somebody, there's also someone from the Department of Mathematics at Princeton University in, uh, in the USA. So, it's a very crude metric of what languages um, are mentioned in this document. So in this document, 484 pages, you actually have 20 mentions for the language Sanskrit and 12 mentions for Hindi, uh, 5 for Tamil, 3 for Kannada, 2 for Telugu, 2 for Malayalam and there is no mention of Bangla or Bengali uh, language in the entire document. So what are the major issues that I have with this report? I want to emphasize I because these are my personal opinions and you may or may not agree with them. So this report presents some strong statements as if they are facts with no reference to any evidence backing these claims. So there are some very tall statements in this document but there, are, there is no evidence uh, supporting those statements. The entire report reads as a propaganda, not as a policy. And I'm going to explain to you what is the difference between a propaganda and a policy. It's full of nonsensical stuff, lots of lies in this policy document. And I'll explain all of this in the next few minutes. So first of all, let's just spend one minute trying to think what is a propaganda and how it is different from a policy. A policy is a course of action proposed by an organization based on demonstrated need and evidence. So if you read the policy documents, they will uh, labor upon the point that there is a need, um, there is an area of need, uh, they will show the gap in, uh, in development uh, within the organization or the country or the institution. They will show data to say where the defect is, where the gap is, and they will show evidence to say um, what needs to be done in order to fix the gap. But a propaganda is a different kind of document. Um, information, especially information of a biased or misleading nature, 
is often used to promote a point of view. And if you're reading a document where information of biased nature is given to promote a specific point of view, that's nothing but a propaganda. And this is exactly what the Kasturi Rangan report is. And how can you know something is a propaganda or not? I mean, none of us are experts of propaganda. So how can you actually realize something is a propaganda or not? Um, in social psychology, uh, lots of work has been done in looking at advertising and uh, propaganda techniques. A lot of work was initially done when uh, um, people got worried about the, the European uh, ideological um, spread that was happening during the World War time, the Hitler time, the Nazi times. So there's a lot we know now about what kind of messages are propagandas. So I'm going to just show you a few features of what a propaganda uh, uh, document looks like. The propaganda documents usually start with name calling a minority group. They will name somebody, they will uh, make the reader think that minority is uh, the reason why majority of people are in, uh, in some sort of trouble. Number two, they will actually make a lot of general, generalistic sweeping statements. They will appeal to common belief and common practice uh, without any specificity. If you say something specific, it can be debated, researched further. But propaganda documents will keep uh, the messages to generalistic uh, level. They won't go into specifics. They will also try and glorify history. History will not get critically examined. They will not say what was wrong and what was right in a historical um, fact, but they will glorify the history. And propaganda documents also give false analogies, false examples, in order to um, uh, labor a point. There's also um, um, a phenomenon called card stacking that you often see in propaganda documents. They present only the favorable good information. They don't say anything bad about the ideas that they're um, proposing. Uh, a, a very neutral policy statement will state both the downsides of an intervention and also the upsides of it. But a propaganda statement will not. And propagandas also use something called bandwagon method. They will uh, invoke the desire in the reader to fit with the group, to conform to the group. So uh, they will tell you to get onto the bandwagon and the bandwagon is going to leave or it's going to go to some nice fancy destination so you have to get onto that. So they will create that kind of urge in us. They will also invoke fear. They will not um, invoke reasoning. They will invoke fear. Um, a policy document, a proper policy document does not invoke any emotional response. It will only invoke reasoning. But a propaganda document, when you read it, you will be afraid. You will have some fear going through your, uh, uh, your mind. Uh, no evidence for figures or facts will be presented in propaganda documents. But in a policy document, you will have all statements of fact verifiable with references with bibliography. Propaganda documents also do something called concept transfer. They will associate two completely unrelated concepts. They will use a similar choice of words, but they will associate two different concepts um, with the same word. That kind of conceptual confusion will not be present in a policy document. There will be a clear uh, exposition of concepts and distinctions between subcategories will be preserved in a policy document. Propaganda also, uh, propaganda writers also depend a lot on testimonials, opinions from people. They will use opinions as reasons. For example, they will say uh, the opinion of a great person is such, the, is, this, this particular opinion is coming from a great person, which means they have to do something. So that kind of argument will be seen in the propaganda document. Uh, but only observations, measurements will be used for reasoning in a policy document. Finally, a propaganda document will contain a lot of loaded words. Uh, the writer will slip in words that invoke strong public opinion, even though it's not directly relevant to the arguments that are being made. Uh, a policy uh, argument will uh, stay on the course without straying into uh, irrelevant issues. So this is just a summary of the differences that you can expect uh, between a propaganda and a policy document. I'm going to show you many, many examples in a Kasturi Rangan report, which clearly suggests that it's a propaganda, not a policy document. So the very first thing is name calling. Uh, if you open a Kasturi Rangan uh, document, a policy document, it starts with uh, identifying one minority group. They give a name for this group. They call this group as the 15% economic elite group. And they say that this group contributes to the suffering of another group. What is that another group? This another larger majority group is identified as a, as a marginalized large section of society based on language and kept out of higher paying jobs and higher socioeconomic strata. Very mischievously, uh, a casual statistics is thrown when they describe these two groups, minority group and majority group. They actually um, throw the statistics of 54% um, 
of Indians who speak Hindi when they talk about the, the larger marginalized section of society um, who are kept out of higher paying jobs. Remember, they are not making a direct connection that the uh, Indians who speak Hindi are marginalized, but they are insinuating. Insinuation means um, making somebody uh, see, connect the dots themselves without actually directly um, giving a, a statement. So that's exactly what happens in the early opening section of uh, Kasturi Dangan report, name calling. Uh, so they're deliberately creating a sense that the majority uh, Hindi speakers are denied the rightful development by a 15% minority who prefer English in this country. And then when you read the document further, you see several examples of generalities. For example, there's one uh, quote, many developed countries around the world have demonstrated that being well educated in one's language, culture and traditions is not a detriment but indeed a huge benefit. Now if you just read the statement stand alone you'll say okay there's nothing wrong with it right but note the generality no one to my knowledge no one uh, uh, and to the knowledge of the writers because they're not giving any references okay so no one has conducted a specific experiment to demonstrate that uh, being well educated in one's own language culture uh, um, uh, it's a huge benefit rather than a detriment. So that kind of social experiments are not easy to do. So nobody has done anything like that. So there's no causal logic in this argument. Yes, there are some countries which are developed. Those countries may, may have um, um, their own language, culture and tradition. But there's no relationship between the development they have and preservation of the language, culture and tradition. But they make statements like this without any causal link. So they also say, um, for this reason, it is strongly recommended that India's languages, art and culture be given a prominence again that has been lost in the recent years. So, in other words, what they're trying to do is they're saying to you, everyone is doing it. You know, every developed country is keeping its own language, culture, and tradition. So, don't think too much about it. Everyone is doing it. So, let's do it as well. So, this is called appealing to common practice without, you know, critically examining the consequences of the practice. What happens before you start a practice, what happens during a practice and what happens after you do something, those things are not considered. Instead they say everybody is doing it, let's do it as well. So this generality is the, uh, the second important theme of this uh, document. And they glorify history like anything. Throughout this document, there is repeated references glorifying history of India. Uh, well distorted history of India. They don't really talk about the history of people's struggles. They only talk about the, the glorifying part of, uh, part of Indian history. So they create a historical sense through mention of places and people with no causal logic and no need for invoking those uh, statements at all. For example, they keep talking about the University of Nalanda and Takshashila. Since the times of Nalanda and Takshashila, Indian education has been holistic, they say. That invokes a sense of glory and pride in you. But is there any truth in this statement? What, whatever it means by uh, holistic, who knows? Um, so, and what happened before the times of Nalanda and Takshashila? Was Indian education not holistic before that? What is the evidence for it? So, this is no uh, evidence-based statements here. They just invoke a sense of glory, which stops you from examining the statement further, um, and and stops you from examining the baseless conclusion that follows, because you are beaming with pride about your own history. And this document is full of false analogies and I'm going to give you just one or two examples. What is a false analogy? Giving inaccurate or incomplete but fascinating examples to make a point even though the example and the point you make will not have any logical cost-effect relationship. Uh, so for, for example, they talk about uh, um, this following statement. Uh, they, they talk about promoting liberal arts. Uh, in this particular document, liberal arts means 64 kala, 64 kalas. Um, in Tamil, we say, Aya kalaigal arubati nangu, 64 kala. So they talk about the 64 kalas, and they're using the following analogy to say 64 kalas are important part of education. Steve Jobs was famous for ideas for products that married top notch aesthetics with top notch engineering. When asked about why the Mac computer revolutionized computing, he remarked, I think part of what made the Mac great was that the people working on it were musicians and poets and artists and zoologists and historians who also happen to be the best computer scientists in the world. Interestingly, Steve Jobs said some more things immediately after this statement, but the uh, writers of this policy, uh, sorry, the propaganda, are omitting that statement. And what is that statement? Steve Jobs said, but if it hadn't been computer science, these people would have been doing amazing things in other fields. So he wasn't saying that everybody has to uh, study liberal arts 
he was just suggesting that people who know liberal arts, if they study computer science as well, uh, that is the reason why a Mac computer was uh, coming out as a nice product. Anyway, so they are trying to uh, show you incomplete as well as inaccurate uh, statements to uh, uh, examples uh, to make you think as if uh, liberal arts is important. We also use a technique called card stacking. Uh, card, what is card stacking? Negative consequences of a plan of a method uh, will be conspicuously not mentioned. So they will deliberately not say what is a problem in doing something. Instead, they will keep stacking up the positives of something. So you forget to, forget to ask about the negatives. Um, it's a bit like you know sometimes we, we doctors when we prescribe medicine uh, we have to say both the good things and side effects of the medication, good effects and side effects. We don't say side effects, and if you say only the good effects of something, it's not fair and that will influence the decision that people make. So they try to do that kind of approach here in this Kasturi uh, Rangan report. So they, some, they say something like, um, the law curriculum, so they are now talking about how to train lawyers, okay. So the law curriculum has to fall back upon the culture and traditions of people, the history of legal institutions and victory of dharma over adharma writ largely in Indian literature and mythology. Interesting statement, but they are not saying anything about the negative consequences of going back to the olden days and giving a traditional justice delivery. Um, so they are not talking about the problems in mythology based the ethics. Can you use uh, mythologies like Ramayana and uh, um, Mahabharata and, and use that for delivering uh, uh, criminal justice? So they don't really invoke any of those uh, reasonings, arguments. They just show you only um, glo uh, the glorified parts of history and, and stack up positive things and not show you the negative things at all. So I'm going to take a quick break, um, put this video up and then show you the, uh, uh, the next part in a few minutes.